Hello, I'm Ron Wilson. In this month's news, the Financial Services Council delayed releasing its new Life Insurance Code of Practice until October, due to further development needed in the areas of sales practices and claims handling. In international news, the UK's Brexit vote triggered immediate downgrades in its credit rating, and in the US, the manufacturing sector expanded in June for the fourth month in a row. Meanwhile, the RBA has kept the cash rate at 1.75% in the wake of increased market volatility arising from the Brexit. Michael Pollock has the details. The FSC is delaying releasing its new life insurance code of practice until October from the original scheduled release date of 1 July 2016. The FSC began developing the code in August 2015 in response to the Trowbridge Report recommendations. This report called for a guaranteed level of service to be provided to consumers when purchasing life insurance and for plain English information in insurance documents. The FSC's reason for the three-month delay was that following ongoing consultation with stakeholder consumer groups, there was a need for further development in a number of areas, including sales practices and claims handling. In late June, the FSC released the second Johnson Report which identified the barriers to Australia increasing exports of funds management and other financial services to the Asia-Pacific region. Australia as a financial centre, seven years on, the second Johnson Report, indicates little progress in removing barriers identified in the original Johnson Report from 2009. The report also identifies another six barriers emerging since the original report. These are Australia's overall withholding tax regime beyond the specific instances identified in the original Johnson report, treatment of foreign exchange gains and losses under Australia's taxation rules, the lack of multi-currency class investment vehicles, a unique regulatory approach under the single responsible entity model, lack of recognition of Australian financial services licences offshore, and uncapped liability on capital for responsible entities and product issuers. In a shock for financial markets, which had been increasingly confident that Britain would vote to remain in the EU, the Brexit victory by a margin of 52% to 48% triggered almost immediate responses from two credit rating agencies. Standard & Poor's lowered the UK's sovereign credit rating by two notches from AAA to AA, while Fitch ratings downgraded the UK to an equivalent level from AA plus to AA. S&P Global Ratings says that the Brexit will weaken the predictability, stability and effectiveness of policymaking in the UK and affect its economy, GDP growth and fiscal and external balances. US manufacturing sector economic activity expanded in June for the fourth consecutive month as the ISM Manufacturing Index rose to 53.2% an increase of 1.9 points over its May reading. This was the strongest index reading since February 2015 and indicated that while manufacturers still faced a challenging environment, the headwinds from a rising US dollar and commodity-related cutbacks to investment spending had eased to some extent. The Bank of Japan once again kept monetary policy unchanged at its 16 June meeting. The BIJ's decision was based on its view that Japan's economy is likely to be on a moderate expanding trend. The year-on-year -year rate of change in the CPI is likely to be slightly negative or about 0% for the first time, being due to the decline in energy prices. The BIJ says it will continue to conduct money market operations, so the monetary base increases at an annual pace of 80 trillion yen and maintain an interest rate of minus 0.1%. With no clear outcome available from the Australian federal election at the time of its July meeting, and increased volatility in financial markets due to Britain's vote to leave the EU, the RBA decided to keep the cash rate at 1.75%. RBA Governor Glenn Stevens noted that funding costs for high-quality borrowers remain low, and globally, monetary policy remains remarkably accommodative. Stevens repeated his warning from prior month's statements that while in Australia recent data suggest overall growth is continuing, the recent gains in the exchange rate could complicate necessary adjustments in the Australian economy. Total private sector credit increased at a seasonally adjusted rate of 0.4% in May, down slightly from April 0.5% gain. However, in year-on-year -year terms, it was up 6.5% to May, following growth of 6.7% in April the fastest annual rate post-GFC. Housing loans accounted for the bulk of total credit gains in May, up 0.5% over the month and 6.9% over the year. 
This was down from a recent peak of 7.5% recorded towards the end of 2015, with the decline in the annual pace of growth due to a sharp drop in credit for investor housing. Following APRA's directive to keep growth in the value of investor loans to under 10% per annum, the annual growth in credit for investor housing dropped from 11% in the year to May 2015 to just 6% to May 2016. Meanwhile, owner-occupied housing credit grew 7.4% over the year to May 2016, its strongest annual growth rate since August 2010.